diffraction, and interference. Describe what Huygen stated about light. Describe what affects the extent of diffraction. Explain how interference affects wave amplitudes. Describe what Young's interference equipment demonstrated. Explain how the colors seen in thin films are produced. Describe how laser light is emitted. Explain how a hologram is produced. The big idea. The wave model of light explains diffraction and interference. Today, Isaac Newton is most famous for his accomplishments in mechanics, his laws of motion, and universal gravitation. Early in his career, however, he was famous for his work on light. Newton pictured light as a beam of ultra-tiny material particles. With this model, he could explain reflection as a bouncing of the particles from a surface, and he could explain reflection as a result of deflecting forces from the surface acting on the light particles. In the 18th and 19th centuries, this particle model gave way to the wave model of light because waves could explain reflection, refraction, and everything else that was known about light at that time. In this chapter, we will investigate the wave aspects of light to explain two important phenomena, diffraction and interference. What produces iridescent colors in thin films? 1. Submerge a piece of construction paper in a container of water. 2. Apply one drop of clear nail polish to the surface of the water and watch it spread out over the surface of the water. 3. After the nail polish has stopped spreading, slowly lift the construction paper out of the water. The nail polish should adhere to the surface of the paper. Allow the paper to dry. Observing. What do you observe as you view the dried film on the surface of the paper? Predicting. What do you think you will see if you view the film from various angles? Making generalizations. How would you explain the colors produced by the thin film? 31.1. Huygens' Principle. In the late 1600s, a Dutch mathematician scientist, Christian Huygens, proposed a very interesting idea about light. Huygens stated that light waves spreading out from a point source may be regarded as the overlapping of tiny secondary wavelets and that every point on any wave front may be regarded as a new point source of secondary waves. We see this in figure 31.1. The idea that wave fronts are made up of tinier wave fronts is called Huygens' principle. Figure 31.1. These drawings are from Huygens' book, Treatise on Light. A. Light from point A expands in wave fronts. B. Every point behaves as if it were a new source of waves. Wave fronts. Look at the spherical wave front in figure 31.2. Each point along the wave front, AA prime, is the source of a new wavelet that spreads out in a sphere from that point. Only a few of the infinite number of wavelets are shown in the figure. The new wave front, B prime, can be regarded as a smooth, surface enclosing the infinite number of overlapping wavelengths that started from AA prime a short time earlier. As a wave front spreads, it appears less curved. Very far from the original source, the wave front seems to form a plane. A good example is the plane waves that arrive from the sun. A Wagen's wavelet construction for plane waves is shown in figure 31.3. Figure 31.2. 
Every point along the spherical wavefront AA prime is the source of a new wavelet. Figure 31.3, far away from the source, the wave fronts appear to form a plane. In a two-dimensional drawing, the planes are shown as straight lines. The laws of reflection and refraction are illustrated via Wigan's principle in figure 31.4. Wigan's principle in water waves. You can observe Wigan's principle in water waves that are made to pass through a narrow opening. A wave with straight wave fronts can be generated in water by repeatedly dipping a stick lengthwise into the water as shown in figure 31.5. When the straight wave fronts pass through the opening in a barrier, interesting wave patterns result. When the opening is wide, you'll see the straight wave fronts pass through without change, except at the corners, where the wave fronts are bent into the shadow regions in accord with Huygens' principle. Figure 31.4. Each point along a wave front is the source of a new wave, A. The law of reflection can be proven using Huygens' principle, B. Huygens' principle can also illustrate refraction. Figure 31.5. When plane waves are created in a tank of water, they produce a pattern as they pass through an opening in a barrier. As you narrow the width of the opening, less of the wave gets through, and the spreading into the shadow region is more pronounced. When the opening is small compared with the wavelength of the waves, Huygens' idea that every part of the wave front can be regarded as a new source and new wavelets become quite apparent. As the wave moves into the narrow opening, the water sloshing up and down in the opening is easily seen to act as a point source of circular waves that fan out on the other side of the barrier. The photos in figure 31.6 are top views of water waves generated by a vibrating stick. Note how the wave fans out more as the gap through which they pass becomes smaller. Concept checked. What did Huygens state? about light waves. 31.6. The extent to which the water waves bend depends on the size of the opening. 31.2. Diffraction. Any bending of waves by means other than reflection or refraction is called diffraction. Figure 31.6 shows the diffraction of straight wave water waves through various openings. When the opening is wide compared with the wavelength, the spreading effect is small. As the opening becomes narrower, the diffraction becomes more pronounced. The same occurs for all kinds of waves, including light waves. Diffraction of visible light. When light passes through an opening that is large compared with the wavelength of light, as shown in figure, 31.7a, it casts a rather sharp shadow. Figure 31.7, diffraction occurs when light waves pass through an opening. A, light casts a sharp shadow with some fuzziness at the edges when the opening is large compared with the wavelength of light. And B, because of diffraction, it casts a fuzzier shadow when the opening is extremely narrow. When light passes through a small opening, such as a thin razor slit in a piece of opaque material, it casts a fuzzy shadow for the light fans out, like the water through the narrow opening, as shown in figure 31.7b. The light is diffracted by the thin slit. Diffraction is not confined to the spreading of light through narrow slits or other openings. Diffraction occurs to some degree for all shadows. Even the sharpest shadow is blurred at the edges. When light is of a single color, diffraction can produce sharp diffraction fringes 
at the edge of the shadow as shown in figure 31.8. In white light, the fringes merge together to create a fuzzy blur at the edge of a shadow. Figure 31.8. Diffraction fringes around the scissors are evident in the shadows of laser light, which is of a single frequency. Why is blue light used to view tiny objects in an optical microscope? Blue light has a shorter wavelength than most of other wavelengths of visible light, so there's less diffraction. More details of the object will be visible under blue light. Factors that affect diffraction. The extent of diffraction depends on the relative size of the wavelength compared with the size of the obstruction that casts the shadow. This is illustrated by figure 31.9. When the wavelength is long compared with the obstruction, the wave diffracts more. Long waves are better at filling in shadows. This is why foghorns emit low frequency, long wavelength sound waves to fill in blind spots. Likewise for radio waves of the standard AM broadcast band. These are very long compared with the size of most objects in their path. Figure 31.9. The amount of diffraction depends on the wavelength of the size of the obstruction. A. Waves tend to spread into the shadow regions. B. When the wavelength is about the size of the object, the shadow is soon filled in. C. When the wavelength is short compared with the width of the object, a sharper shadow is cast. Long waves don't see relatively small buildings in their path. They diffract or bend readily around buildings and reach more places than shorter waves do. Diffraction of radio and TV waves. FM radio waves have shorter wavelengths than AM waves do, so they don't diffract as much around buildings and aren't received as well as AM radio waves are in mountain canyons or in city canyons. This is why many localities have poor FM reception while AM stations come in loud and clear. TV waves, which are also electromagnetic waves, behave much like FM waves. Both FM and TV transmission are line of sight, meaning that obstacles between the transmission tower and antennas for receiving TV broadcasts can cause reception problems. Diffraction in microscopy. Diffraction is not so helpful when we wish to see very small objects with microscopes. If the size of the object is the same as the wavelength of light, the image of the object will be blurred by diffraction. If the object is smaller than the wavelength of light, no structure can be seen. This is why the bacteria you look at in biology lab just appear as little dots or rods. The internal details are too small to be seen with visible light. No amount of magnification can defeat this fundamental diffraction limit. To see smaller details, you have to use shorter wavelengths. A beam of electrons has a wavelength associated with it that can be a thousand times shorter than the wavelengths of visible light. Microscopes that use beams of electrons to illuminate tiny things are called electron microscopes. Because of the shorter wavelengths used, the diffraction limit of the electron microscope is much less than that of an optical microscope. This is the head of an Antarctic mite magnified 15,000 times using an electron microscope. Diffraction and dolphins. Smaller details can be better seen with smaller wavelengths. This is cleverly employed by the dolphin in scanning its environment with high frequency sound, ultrasound. The echoes 
of longer wavelength sound give the dolphin, like the one pictured in 3110, an overall image of objects in its surroundings. To examine more detail, the dolphin emits sounds of shorter wavelength. With these sound waves, skin, muscle, and fat are almost transparent to dolphins, but bone, teeth, and gas-filled cavities are clearly apparent. Physical evidence of cancers, tumors, heart attacks, and even emotional states can all be seen by the dolphins. Figure 3110, a dolphin emits ultra-short wavelength sound to locate and identify objects in its environment. The dolphin has always done naturally what humans in the medical field have only recently been able to do with ultrasounds. Concept check. What affects the extent of diffraction? Notes. Cable TV avoids line of sight transmission problems by sending the signal through a cable or optic fiber rather than over the air. Satellite TV is line of sight, but normally without a mountain between you and the satellite. Can you see diffraction in the sky? 1. Hold two fingers close together between your eye and an illuminated source such as the sky. 2. Look carefully at the narrow opening. Do you see diffraction fringes? 3. Vary the width of the opening and the distance of your fingers from your eye. Cut a thin slit in a piece of cardboard and repeat the experiment. Vary the size of the slit by bending the cardboard slightly. Think, how do the diffraction fringes change with the width of the slit? 313 Interference. If you drop two stones into water at the same time, the two sets of waves that result cross each other and produce what is called an interference pattern. Within an interference pattern, wave amplitudes may be increased, decreased, or neutralized. When the crest of one wave overlaps the crest of another, their individual effects add together. This is constructive interference. When the crest of one wave overlaps the trough of another, their individual effects are reduced. This is destructive interference. Constructive and destructive interference of waves is, is illustrated in figure 3111. 3111. Waves can interfere with each other constructively or destructively. Water waves can be produced in shallow tanks of water known as ripple tanks under more carefully controlled conditions. Interestingly, patterns are produced when two sources of waves are placed side by side. Small spheres are made to vibrate at a controlled frequency in the water while the wave patterns are photographed from above. The gray spokes are regions of destructive interference. The dark and light striped regions are regions of constructive interference. The greater the frequency of the vibrating spheres, the closer together the stripes, and the shorter the wavelength. Note, in figure 3112, how the number of regions of destructive interference depend on the wavelength and on the distance between the wave sources. Concept check. How does interference affect wave amplitudes? Figure 3112. You can observe interference from overlapping water waves from two vibrating sources, A, B. The separation between the sources is the same but the wavelength in B is shorter than the wavelength in A. B, C, the wavelengths are the same, but the sources are closer together in C than in B. 31.4, Young's Interference Experiment. In 1801, the British physicist and physician, Thomas Young, performed an experiment that was to make him famous. Young discovered that when monochromatic light, light of a single color, was directed through two closely spaced pinholes, fringes of brightness and darkness were produced 
on the screen behind. He realized that the bright fringes of light resulted from light waves from both holes arriving crest to crest, constructive interference, more light. Similarly, the dark areas resulted from light waves arriving trough to crest, destructive interference, no light. Why is it important that monochromatic single frequency light be used in Young's interference experiment? If light of a variety of wavelengths were diffracted by the slit, dark fringes for one wavelength would be filled in with bright fringes for another, resulting in no distinct fringe pattern. If the path difference equals one half wavelength for one frequency, it cannot also equal one half wavelength for any other frequency. Different frequencies will fill in the fringes. Figure 3113 shows Young's original drawing of a two-source interference pattern. Young's interference experiment convincingly demonstrate the wave nature of light originally proposed by Huygens. Double slit experiment. Young's experiment is now done with two closely spaced slits instead of pinholes. So the fringes are straight lines. A sodium vapor lamp provides a good source of monochromatic light and a laser is even better. The experiment arrangement is shown in figure 3114A. Figure 3113. In Thomas Young's original drawing of two source interference patterns, the dark circles represent wave crests. The white spaces between the crests represent troughs. Letters C, D, E, and F mark regions of destructive interference. Figure 3114. Young's interference experiment demonstrated the wave nature of light. A. The arrangement for the experiment includes two closely spaced slits and a monochromatic light source. B, the interference fringes produced are straight lines. The patterns of fringes that result are shown in figure 3114B. Figure 3115 shows how the series of bright and dark lines results from the different path lengths from the slits to the screen. A bright fringe occurs when waves from both slits arrive in phase. Dark regions occur when waves arrive out of phase. Diffraction gratings. Interference patterns are not limited to double slit arrangements. A multitude of closely spaced parallel slits makes up what is called a diffraction grating. Many spectrometers use diffraction gratings rather than prisms to disperse light into colors. Figure 3115. Light from O passes through slits A and B and produce an interference pattern on the screen at the right. Whereas a prism separates the colors of light by refraction, a diffraction grating such as the one shown in figure 3116 separates colors by interference. More common diffraction gratings are seen in reflective materials used in items such as costume jewelry. These materials have hundreds of thousands of close together tiny grooves that diffract light into a brilliant spectrum of colors. The pits on the reflective surface of an audio compact disc not only provide high fidelity music, but also diffract light spectacularly into its component colors. Figure 3116, a diffraction grating disperses light into colors by interference among light beams diffracted by many slits or grooves.
But long before the advent of these high-tech items, the feathers of birds were nature's diffraction gratings, as is beautifully illustrated in figure 3117. Similarly, the striking colors of opals come from layers of tiny silica spheres that act as diffraction gratings. Concept check, what did Young's experiment demonstrate? Figure 3117, diffraction from ridges in a peacock's feathers produce beautiful iridescent colors. Thirty-one five interference from thin films. Everyone who has seen soap bubbles or gasoline spilled on wet pavement, as shown in Figure thirty-one eighteen, has noticed the beautiful spectrum of colors reflected from them. Some types of bird feathers have colors that seem to change you as the bird moves. The colors seen in the thin films are produced by the interference in the films of light waves of mixed frequencies. The phenomena in which the interference of light waves of mixed frequencies produce a spectrum of colors is known as iridescence. A thin film such as soap bubbles has two closely spaced surfaces. 3118, the intriguing colors of gasoline on a wet street correspond to different thicknesses of the thin film. Light that reflects from one surface may cancel light that reflects from the other surface. For example, the film may be just the right thickness in one place to cause the destructive interference of, say, blue light. If the film is illuminated with white light, then the light that reflects to your eye will have no blue in it. What happens when blue is taken away from white light? The answer is the complementary color will appear. And for the cancellation of blue, we get yellow. So the soap bubbles will appear yellow whenever blue is canceled. In a thicker part of the film, where green is canceled, the bubble will appear magenta. The different colors correspond to the cancellations of their complementary colors by different thicknesses of the film. Figure 3119 illustrates interference for a thin layer of gasoline on a layer of water. Figure 3119, the thin film of gasoline is just the right thickness that monochromatic blue light reflected from the top surface of the gasoline is canceled by light of the same wavelength reflected from the water. Light reflects from both the upper gasoline air surface and the lower gasoline water surface. Suppose that the incident beam is monochromatic blue, as in the illustration. If the gasoline layer is just the right thickness to cause cancellation of light of that wavelength, then the gasoline surface appears dark to the eye. On the other hand, if the incident beam is white sunlight, the gasoline surface appears yellow to the eye. Blue is subtracted from the white, leaving the complementary color yellow. The beautiful colors reflected from some types of seashells are produced by interference of light in their thin, transparent coatings. So are the sparkling colors from fractures within opals. Interference colors can even be seen in the thin film of detergent left when dishes are not properly rinsed. Figure 3120, interference colors with big bubbles. Think, what color will reflect from the soap bubble in sunlight when its thickness is such that red is canceled? You will see the color cyan, which is the complementary color of red. Interference provides the principal method for measuring the wavelength of light. Wavelength of other regions of the electromagnetic spectrum are also measured with interference techniques. Extremely small distances, millionths of a centimeter, are measured with instruments called interferometers, 
which make use of the principle of interference, notes. Soap bubble colors come from interference of reflected light from inside and outside surfaces of the bubble. Where did the colors go? Dip a dark colored coffee mug in dishwashing detergent and hold it sideways as if you were pouring from it. Look at the reflected light from the soap film that covers the mouth. What do you observe when the film becomes very thin just before it pops? Think. Why does the top appear black when the film is very thin? These instruments are sensitive enough to detect the displacement at the end of a long, several centimeters thick, solid steel bar when you gently apply opposite twists to opposite ends with your hands. They are among the most accurate measuring instruments known. Concept check. How are the colors seen in thin films produced? 31.6. Laser light. Light emitted by a common lamp is incoherent. In incoherent light, the crests and troughs of light waves don't line up with one another. And there are many different frequencies as well. As shown in figure 31.21, incoherent light is chaotic. Interference within a beam of incoherent light is rampant, and a beam spreads out after a short distance, becoming wider and wider and less intense with increased distance, even if a beam is filtered so that it is monochromatic, has a single frequency, as illustrated in 3122, it is still incoherent because the waves are out of phase and interference with one another. Figure 3121, incoherent white light contains wavelengths of many frequencies and wavelengths that are out of phase with one another. 3122, light of a single frequency and wavelength can still be out of phase. The slightest differences in their directions result in a spreading with increased distance. Coherent light. A beam of light that has the same frequency, phase, and direction is said to be coherent. Figure 3123 illustrates coherent light waves. There is no interference of waves within the beam. Only a beam of coherent light will not spread and diffuse. Coherent light is produced by a laser whose name comes from light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Laser light is emitted when excited atoms of a solid, liquid, or gas are stimulated to emit photons in phase. Figure 3123, coherent light consists of identical waves that are all in phase. Within a laser, a light wave emitted from one atom stimulates the emission of light from a neighboring atom so that the crests of each wave coincide. These waves stimulate the emission of others in cascade fashion and a beam of coherent light is produced. This is very different from the random emissions of light from atoms in common sources. Operation of lasers. A laser is not a source of light. It is simply a converter of energy taking advantage of the process of stimulated emission to concentrate a certain fraction of the energy input, commonly much less than 1%, into a thin beam of coherent light. Like all devices, a laser can put out no more energy than it takes in. In a helium neon laser, which is shown in figure 3124, a high voltage applied to a mixture of helium and neon gas energizes helium atoms to a state of high energy. Before the helium can emit light, it gives up its energy by collision with neon, which is boosted to an otherwise hard to come by matched energy state. Light emitted by neon stimulated other energy neon atoms to emit matched frequency light. The process cascades. 
and a coherent beam of light is produced. The output remains steady because the helium is constantly re-energized. Applications of lasers. Lasers come in many types and have broad applications in diverse fields. Figure 3124, a helium neon laser emits a steady output of coherent light. Surveyors and construction workers use them as chalk lines. Surgeons use them as scalpels, and garment manufacturers use them as cloth cutting saws. They are used to read product codes, like the one shown in figure 3125, into cash registers, to read the music and video signals in CDs and DVDs, and to read the barcode on the cover of your conceptual physics textbook. Lasers are now being used to cut metals transmit information through optical fibers, and measure speeds of vehicles for law enforcement purposes. Scientists have been able to use lasers as optical tweezers that can hold and move objects. A most impressive product of laser light is the hologram. Figure 3125 a product code is read by laser light that reflects from the bar pattern and is converted to an electrical signal that is fed into a computer. The signal is high when light is reflected from the white spaces and low when reflected from a dark bar. 31.7, the hologram. A hologram is a three-dimensional version of a photograph that contains the whole message or entire picture in every portion of its surface. To the naked eye, it appears to be an imageless piece of transparent film, but on its surface is a pattern of microscopic interference fringes. Light diffracted from these fringes produces an image that is extremely realistic. Holograms are also difficult to reproduce, hence their use on credit cards. Holograms viewed with white light are common on credit cards. Watch for them on money. Spiky stars link to vision. All through the ages, stars in the night sky have been drawn with pointed spikes. Ever wonder why? The reason doesn't have to do with the stars, which are point sources of light in the night sky, but rather with poor eyesight and diffraction. The surface of our eyes becomes scratched by a variety of causes and acts like a sort of diffraction grating. Instead of seeing point sources of light, we sometimes see spikes that may shimmer and twinkle due to temperature differences in the atmosphere. In a windy desert region where sandstorms are frequent, our corneas are even more scratched, and we see more vivid star spikes. Stars don't really have pointed spikes. They just appear spiked because of scratches on the surface of our eyes. Producing a hologram. A hologram is produced by the interference between two laser light beams on photographic film. The two beams are part of one beam. One part illuminates the object and is reflected from the object to the film. The second part, called the reference beam, is reflected from a mirror to the film, as shown in figure 3126. Interference between the reference beam and the light reflected from the different points on the object produce a pattern of microscopic fringes on the film. Light from nearer parts of the object travels shorter paths than light from farther parts of the object. Figure 3126. In this simplified arrangement for making a hologram, the laser light that exposes the photographic film is made up of two parts. One part is reflected from the object and one part is reflected from the mirror. The different 
distances traveled will produce slightly different interference patterns with the reference beam. In this way, information about the depth of an object is recorded, viewing a hologram. When light falls on a hologram, it is diffracted by the fringed pattern to produce wave fronts identical in form to the original wave fronts reflected by the object. The diffracted wave fronts produce the same effect as the original reflected wave fronts. As illustrated in figure 3127, when you look through a hologram, you see a three-dimensional virtual image. Looking through a hologram is like looking through a window. Figure 3127, when a hologram is illuminated with coherent light, the diverging diffracted light produces a three-dimensional virtual image. Converging diffracted light produces a real image in front of the hologram. You refocus your eyes to see near and far parts of the image, just as you do when viewing a real object. Converging diffracted light produces a real image in front of the hologram, which can be projected on a screen. Since the image has depth, you cannot see near and far parts of the image in sharp focus for any single position on a flat screen. Parallax is evident when you move your head to the side and see down the sides of the object, or when you lower your head and look underneath the object. Holographic pictures appear to be three-dimensional and therefore are extremely realistic. Interestingly enough, if the hologram is made on film, you can cut it in half and see the entire image on each half. And you can cut one of the pieces in half again and again and see the entire image, just as you can put your eye to any part of a window to see outdoors. Every part of the hologram has received and recorded light from the entire object. Even more interesting is holographic magnification. If holograms are made using short wavelength light and viewed with light of a stronger wavelength, the resulting image is magnified in the same proportion as the wavelength. Holograms made with x-rays would be magnified thousands of times when viewed with visible light and appropriate viewing arrangements. Light is interesting, especially when it is diffracted through the interference fringes of that super sophisticated diffraction grating, the hologram. Concept check. How are holograms produced? Summary, diffraction and interference. Huygens stated that light waves spreading out from a point source may be regarded as the overlapping of tiny secondary wavelets and that every point on any wave front may be regarded as a new point source of secondary waves. Within an interference pattern, wave amplitudes may be increased, decreased, or neutralized. Young's interference experiment convincingly demonstrated the wave nature of light originally proposed by Huygens. The extent of diffraction depends on the relative size of the wavelength compared with the size of the obstruction that casts the shadow. The colors seen in thin films are produced by the interference in the films of light waves of mixed frequencies. Laser light is emitted when excited atoms of solid, liquids, and gases are stimulated to emit photons in phase. A hologram is produced by the interference between two laser light beams on photographic film.